Welcome to Embody Radio. I'm your host, Emily Duncan, kinesiology major, fitness social media influencer, coach, and bikini competitor. On this show, I'm here to spread scientific knowledge on the topics of strength training, nutrition, health, fitness, and physique sports, while also helping you grow stronger as an individual from the inside out. Today, I had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Corey Probst. So Corey, I first listened to her speak back when she was on Lane Norton's podcast, probably like three years ago. And I remember listening to her and I was like, this woman is amazing. And I was like, she's awesome. And so then when I started a podcast, I was like, she's somebody that I need to have on it. Corey is just an overall amazing person. She has degrees in psychology. She works with nutrition. She's just absolutely amazing. She works with Dr. Joe at the Diet Doc, so Dr. Joe Klimzeski. She's overall just a truly, truly incredible person. Um, One of the things that she said, which I thought was really beautiful about her work, was she said, the bulk of my work focuses on the cultivation of motivation, deliberate and conscious change, emotional flexibility, the psychology of eating, and awareness building. So she's just a super awesome person. She focuses a lot on the mindset of dieting and you know how former life events can impact our diets and things like that. She mentors nutrition and fitness entrepreneurs and the art of coaching towards change so they can partner with their clients in the most generative manner for sustainable transformation. So today's conversation, we talked a lot about the concept of why people quote unquote cheat on their diets, even though I don't really like that terminology. It's, it's kind of the best, most widely understood terminology we have, why people go off of their diets, you know, some of the psychological reasons behind that building up psychological fortitude, just becoming more aware of your thoughts surrounding food and surrounding dieting. Another really interesting conversation we had on this episode was we talked about how the idea of self-sabotage is actually not a real thing, or at least in her opinion. And it truly, part of the reason I love this interview so much is I truly love when people can give me a new perspective on on something. And she gave me a new perspective on the concept of self-sabotage and why it might not really be a real thing and what it actually is. But you guys will have to listen to hear what it actually is, or at least in the eyes of Dr. Probst. So thank you guys so much for tuning in for another episode today. Let's get into this interview with Dr. Corey Probst. Welcome to another episode of Embody Radio. I am so excited for our guest this week. This week we have Dr. Corey Probst on the show. So welcome to the show, Corey. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Me too. So Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, you guys. I was telling her before the show, the first time I ever heard her talk was literally on a podcast like three years ago. It was on uh, Lane Norton's <laughs> podcast. And I was like, this woman knows her stuff. This is amazing. And she's just continued to put some amazing things out there in the mm-hmm. fitness industry. So Corey, welcome. Dr. Probes, welcome. I don't know what you prefer to be called. I'll be Corey. Yes. <laughs> all right. I love it. It's casual. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself to listeners. Let them know who you are, what you do, what your thing is, what your niche is. Just tell them all about you. Yeah, well, first, thank you again. I'm, I appreciate that you wanted to have me on. And it's any okay. opportunity that I can get to have a conversation with someone about an important topic that more people need to know about and be able to integrate into their lives, I Absolutely. will take. So thanks I love again. It. Yeah. You're so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So I am the wellness director, vice president, and I'm a health psychologist with the Diet Doc. And uh, Dr. Joe Klimzeski, who probably a lot of your listeners would recognize that name, he's my business partner. Um, What we do is we have one of the most well-respected nutrition platforms for uh, fitness and nutrition entrepreneurs. So for those who are coaches. And so what we're spending a lot of time doing is mentoring nutrition coaches. Okay. Um, I also have what's called the mental edge program as part of our general population, nutrition and weight loss program, uh, that really focuses on motivation and the psychology of eating and dieting. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what's funny is oftentimes I'll, I get a lot of clients who, they think when they come to me, they're going to be working on eating stuff, (laughs) eating and dieting and how to really drill down into their goals uh, that pertain to their physical um, endeavors. And inevitably it always really boils down into mindset Mm -hmm. and the mental piece of it and uh, the approaches that they're taking in terms of their actions and the manner in which they're thinking and the thoughts that they're having. Because my background, ultimately, Emily, I, I was a therapist. I'm a trained 
um, mm -hmm. therapist and mental health clinician. And while I don't do that anymore, I transitioned into coaching. It's a part of me. I can't extract that out of myself and, right. and the training and the knowledge and the experience that comes with that. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's positive psychology, there's cognitive behavioral training that goes in with that. There's a lot of different theories that I implement acceptance and commitment therapy, um, all different ones that really serve to create a, a generative place for people to really heal. I mean, if I'm going to use a word, it's for helping people to become whole and not see themselves any longer as objects and just mm. fragmented all over the place, operating in a very rigid or a very chaotic way. So we're really, we're working on and what, where I really feel like my area of expertise is in emotional agility. Ooh, I love that phrase. Yeah. So uh, I, as I like to explain it as we learn how to do backbends over the barriers rather than getting stopped by them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, yeah. there's a whole history that comes along with that, but right. we might get into it along the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's so many, so many wonderful nuggets of anything we can talk about here. I mean, we all know that diet is such a big component of the fitness industry. Mm -hmm. And just mm -hmm. like with anything where your mind is, I think people underestimate the concept of mindset, especially as it pertains to dieting, but so many people have, whether it's deep-seated beliefs about food or just deep-seated habits about food that came from how they grew up, that they don't even realize that like that can play such a huge role in their success or lack of success with fitness and with just living a healthy life. We spend so much time, Emily, training our bodies, mm -hmm. and we rarely give enough focus and attention and energy and effort and time towards training our minds mm -hmm. and not just what we think, but understanding how we think and the tendencies we have and how those differ from context to context and from mm -hmm. person to person. What are our triggers? What are the things that get us like emotionally riled up? in a positive way where we feel expansive and open and really passionate and driven. And then on the flip side of the coin, those triggers that cause us to collapse and just, mm -hmm. just kind of feel like we're disintegrating and falling apart. And my job is really to help people begin to understand and observe themselves in a way that gets them more in touch with what is happening here? And not to judge it, mm -hmm. not to say this is bad or it has to be this way and to cling and to grasp and or avoid and push things away. If we're really mm -hmm. going to get into what happens when people are dieting and restricting their food and mm -hmm. like forcing their bodies into certain positions in the gym and just trying to get that PR or whatever it is we're going to bump up against this and we're like, what is happening here? <laughs> right, right. And we don't always know like where the resistance is coming from or what the problem is. So just being able to identify that is such a huge piece of the whole thing. Because if you can't identify the problem or the issue or the trigger or whatever it is, you're never going to be able to fix it. Or even just to be able to say, whoa, okay, that's different that's an experience and not to even feel compelled or driven to figure it out or fix mm -hmm. it or even identify it. But just to say, this is here. <laughs> mm, yeah. I don't know what it is and it's okay right now that I don't know what it is. Maybe I just need to kind of acknowledge it and accept it for what it is right now, not necessarily tell a story about it and get caught up and wrapped up in the, that thought stream, the story, but just be with it. And when we can learn how to do that, Emily, what happens is it dissipates. Like it subsides. Whatever this intensity was, like it's going to change. How you are right now is different than how you are right now. Mm -hmm. And right now, and that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest lessons in life, I think, is just the recognition that everything is temporary. Absolutely. Nothing is permanent. Mm -hmm. Life, it's impermanent. 
And that to me is reassuring, but to a lot of people it's disconcerting because it's like, no, but I want it to stay the same. You know, right. when, it, when I lose this weight, it has to stay off. Right. And so the there only cost a lot of change. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, okay, amazing. So what I really want to try and help people with in this episode is like changing mm-hmm. their mindset around food and dieting and just helping them kind of like we talked about a little bit, helping them identify what barriers they may be running into instead of backbending over, like you so eloquently put it. So when you first start working with someone, whether it's a personal yeah. client or, or just a consultation or whatever, what is kind of your first step with them? What do you try and get them to do to help that realization start coming out? Great question. So first, it's gonna, it really kind of differs from person to person depending on what they're coming to me with and how they're expressing themselves. I can get a lot from the words that people use with me and the manner in which they're sharing their story and what their struggles are. Because some people present with a very kind of like open-mindedness about them where they're, I so want to learn about this. I I recognize I don't know what I don't know. And I want you to be able to shine the light on my blind spots. And then other people will come to me and it's almost as if they already have it figured out and they're going to tell me exactly how it needs to be and what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can relate. There have been clients like this and I'm like, well, and why do you need me? Anyone, anyone doing coaching of any kind has probably run up against both of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that my grounding approach, Emily, is to extract the person's strengths. And Mm -hmm. I know you can relate to this based on your whole warrior mentality. And Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I came... I came from and was trained in a background that utilized the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Mm-hmm. And I've shared this before, but I'm, I was never necessarily comfortable with saying, this is what's wrong with you. You know, this is what we need to fix. This is what's broken about you. I am much more comfortable and I have seen it make such a profound difference in people's lives when we approach it from a strength-based perspective. So I am looking for immediately what strengths does this person have? Qualities, capacities, characteristics, you know, traits that indicate to me that they will thrive. They can thrive. They have thrived. And I'm going to pull out the experiences in their lives, too, that immediately will show them that they do have what it takes. They've already done it. Everything they need is already inside of them. We're just going to tease it out and pull it out and then start using it and applying it. So I think a lot of people, they've gone, if we're talking about dieting, so... 95 to 98% of people who lose weight, what? Gain it back. Mm-hmm. It's like the biggest to, problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not able to sustain their weight loss. And a lot of it has to do with both practical um, sorts of factors. And a lot of it has to do, I would say a greater part of it has to do with adaptive factors, which is the emotional component and Mm -hmm. things within them and in the external environment that cause discomfort and a sense of stress or anxiety, which leads to then, you know, a continuum of different types of emotional eating from just picking here and there to full on binge eating. Mm -hmm. Um, But no matter what, the individuals, when I get started with them, the individuals who come to me are going to immediately begin extracting their strengths with me. And I actually have them take an assessment that explains to them, these are your 24 character strengths. You didn't know you had these, did you? Yeah. (laughs) 
Well, yeah. and that's really awesome because then like, I feel like a lot of times, most of the time when people are coming to a coach, whether it's for nutrition or training or whatever, they're in an extremely vulnerable position. They feel, generally speaking, something poorly about themselves. They feel like they're lacking something. So if you, so they're just pretty down about themselves. So if you can start them out on like, here's all the friggin' great things about you. It's just an empowering and motivating moment that needs to happen. Yeah. You're, well, you're exactly right. And even all the positive psychology research out there shows that, you know, if we're approaching a person from a, a deficit perspective, mm-hmm. here's everything that's wrong and we need to, we're going to fill in the cracks we're not able to create that high level of momentum. Motivation is going to wane a lot more often. And we're not putting them in a position to really be experiencing a greater sense of well being, a greater sense of happiness, a greater sense of enthusiasm, a greater sense of vitality. Um, and we're not necessarily helping them grow and expand in what are called the three basic psychological needs. Mm-hmm. And they are autonomy, competence, and connection. Okay. So I am also just foundationally really grounding myself in the work we're going to be doing needs to be building up and scaffolding mm-hmm. all of the factors in your life internally and externally, uh, what will amount to very high levels of connection, competence, and autonomy. Because that's ultimately what gives us that sense of energy and vitality around life itself and pursuing our goals. Absolutely. Yeah. Nobody wants to go to the gym or, you know, start cooking or whatever if they just go into it feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm such a failure. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to do this. Like I've got all these odds stacked against me. Like so many people, especially like really overweight people are coming to you and they're like, I've tried so many things and like, it's just super discouraging. And so if you can, like you said, if you can give them that little kickstart of like, hey, you can do this. Here's why. Cause you actually have these qualities in you. Like, let's go. They're like, oh my gosh. It's like their eyes open. Yeah. The and it's beautiful. Clear. Let's just pick one thing based on this strength that I already know you have and that now you know you have because you have 24 of them because every human on the planet has these 24 strengths, but so many of them don't know. (laughs) What if we applied this one, this one called curiosity today? Or what if we applied this one, this one called love of learning? What if we applied that one today or with this one meal right in front of you or with this app that you're learning how to track your food on you know it does not have to be this massive goal this massive project that because that's just going to overwhelm it's going to overwhelm mm-hmm. so break absolutely. it got to break it down we got to yeah. break it down. Absolutely. So the listeners of this show, we've got a lot of people out there. We've got a lot of competitors, whether it's bodybuilding, CrossFit, powerlifting, Mm -hmm. lots of competitors and lots of just really avid fitness lovers that are also just super interested in upgrading themselves to like their best level. They want to learn, they want to know. So those people I find often and myself included, we fall into like the type A box. We fall into the type A box. We're pretty rigid. We're regimented. We're like, okay, here's this, this, and this. Here's my ducks. They're in a row. And Mm -hmm. then probably the biggest thing I hear from people question-wise, whether it's my clients or just people on social media is Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, they think they can't. It's not, they actually can't. They just think they can't. I can't stop blowing my diet on the weekends. I get to, you know, I have this brilliant plan going all day long. Like I stick to it, I stick to it, I stick to it. Then I go out to dinner with my partner or my coworkers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was Mm going to do really well. And then it just Mm -hmm. all went and it's over. (laughs) That's like the truth for so many, that that's the truth that they currently have for so many people. So one of those situations that I think is super common. So what do you, what advice do you have for people in that, you know, as far as self-discipline and motivation and just self-control, how, how does that look from a psychological perspective? Are these people really just lazy or is there actually something deeper <laughs> that they can like work to train and get better at? Oh my gosh. I, so many of the people I've worked with have worked to train and got not just gotten better at it, but they wouldn't know what to do if they weren't living in a different way. Mm-hmm. And until they actually feel what it can feel like to have that level of freedom and that 
just like dissipation of that pressure to be on all the time yes. and to be a certain way and to look a certain way and to behave a certain way. Um, it's God liberation. It's liberating. Mm-hmm. That's the word I like to use. <laughs> <laughs> it's freedom producing. Yes. You know, it's back from a client retreat, Ashley Barnhart, one of our owners in Columbus, Ohio puts this on. And I think your friends, are you friends with Adam? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love yeah. him to pieces. He's awesome. So Ashley's in Columbus too. And I, I helped facilitate her yearly retreat and we did this whole workshop on emotional eating. And that word just kept coming up. Freedom, 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 mm-hmm. freedom. And that's what happens when we can practice some level of flexibility. That's not me saying, give up your goals, like let go of everything. Because here's what's ironic about it. In those situations that you describe, your clients are falling into the what the hell effect trap. Mm -hmm. So one thing that they do doesn't necessarily jive with a rule right, that they've set for themselves. And so then there's this thought in their heads that says, well, what the hell? Like, I messed this up. So now the entire day is ruined or the entire evening. I might as well just eat everything and every appetizer on the table. And then it turns into the whole weekend. Mm -hmm. Why do people do that? Is that like a self-sabotage thing that they Mm -hmm. just don't think they can start over in the next meal or whatever? Because that is such a common theme with people. Like, why do we think that way? So we could get into a whole discussion about self-sabotage and it would be an awesome one because I don't, self-sabotage in my mind doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. When we say self-sabotage, what we're really trying to do is protect ourselves. It's Mm -hmm. self-protection because why, why? In reality, why would we engage in a behavior that's going to hurt us or get in the way of something that's important to us? We wouldn't. There's absolutely no reason to do that unless we have another commitment or something that's competing with the first commitment, like connecting with the people at the restaurant or like maybe we fear being rejected if we say no thank you to the dessert or the appetizer that we're offered. Maybe we don't have the language or the communication skills to even know what to say in that situation. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that belonging, for talking from a social perspective, belonging is one of our most basic human needs. And on the flip side of that same coin is not wanting to be rejected, Mm -hmm. then in social situations around food, even if we have a goal that involves like saying no to certain foods and really adhering to certain macros or something, that need to connect and not be potentially rejected is so strong that Mm -hmm the potential exists that we're going to do something to make sure that need is met. But, so it's protective. It's not sabotaging. We're trying to protect what's really important to us as a human being. We couldn't have survived long ago if we weren't part of the tribe and if we weren't connected to people because we would have died. Right, right. <laughs> literally a survival mechanism. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's that. I lost my train of thought to be oh honest. No, we that was amazing. A touch discussion. No, that's, I definitely want to have that talk for sure. Cause I think that's a really, really powerful concept, especially with regards to dieting. But when I remember, I remembered what I was going to say. Okay. So essentially the, what the hell effect, right? Coming mm-hmm. back to that. It's like saying you're, you know, you're driving down the road and you get a flat tire and you get out and you're inspecting it and you're checking it out and you're like, okay, one flat tire you know what? I'm just going to make all of them flat. I'm going to put all of them Let me make this super difficult on myself. <laughs> right, right. Let me make this 10 times worse. I'm getting such a great visual right now. Just me <laughs> on the highway, just like stabbing my tire. Like, yes, right? it. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, like 
having images like that in your head when these sorts of situations happen and when we're in these sorts of circumstances it can lessen the pressure a little bit and mm. if we can make light of the situation and not take it so seriously and get so defensive we can be like oh god <laughs> mm -hmm. you know what i just ate the cake i ate the cake okay I'm a human being, I ate the cake, cake tastes good. Now there are like, dope. there's dopamine swirling around in my body. Yeah. I've got these erectogenic hormones going on with the sugar and the fat together. Like, <laughs> really? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Right. And I think that's a big thing too. You know, I think there's a stark contrast between the person that goes into a situation and maybe they had a plan and then they consciously made the decision while they were there. Like, I'm going to have some cake. Like it doesn't fit my macro or calorie needs for the day. It might stall my fat loss a little bit. I might be up a little bit tomorrow from water or whatever, but like they're consciously making that decision versus the person that comes to you in hindsight and says, it was, it's almost like they blacked out. They're mm -hmm. like, I had, like, I was going to do everything well. And then this happened and then this happened and this happened. And mm -hmm. I ate like five pieces of cake instead of just like having one. <laughs> yes. And totally. like, oh, that wasn't the best idea. But I think there's a big difference there. Oh, yes. They're massive continuum. Like we kind of addressed before um, from just, and I'll bring it back to if we're going into that mode where it's like we're blacking out and we're eating the entire cake and we're eating five sleeves of rice cakes and a jar of peanut butter, whatever it is, because a binge can look different for everyone. Mm -hmm. Then there is, there's something bigger there. And it has a lot to do with our skill in regulating our emotions. Because mm -hmm. what's happening is we're sensing some level of threat, discomfort, this shouldn't be this way. I'm anxious or I'm stressed. And the thought is change it, avoid it, get away from it. It shouldn't be this way. This needs to change immediately. And so we're not self-sabotaging. It's sabotaging the goal. We're not trying to sabotage ourselves. We're trying to protect ourselves from what we're perceiving as something that is harmful and negative and not good mm -hmm. which in but, this case like with the eating thing it's largely like the social connection and acceptance and fear of rejection like we talked sure. about right yeah yeah a lot of times though binges aren't happening with a whole bunch of people around right they're kind of like when you're at home by yourself and you're just like in your brain like just like anxious yeah. and like antsy and like uh, uh, what do i do and I love that you said we're in our brains because we are literally like we're stuck in our heads. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working with individuals who come to me with these sorts of issues that they're struggling with, it becomes a practice in moving below the neck and helping them to understand and acknowledge and get in touch with what's happening in their bodies. Mm -hmm. Because emotions are embodied. They don't, they'll tell me they don't like how they feel. Like, I got to get away from this. Mm -hmm. And food distracts me from it. And when I eat, like, I can shove those emotions down and get away from them for a while. But I think that the big thing is you said distraction. Mm -hmm. It's not an actual remedy. It's not an actual, not. like, sitting in the feeling and feeling it, whatever that feeling is, in order to mm -hmm. overcome it. It's just like, like you said, it's just shoving it down. Yeah. And if we go into it with the goal of overcoming it, it's like, I'm going to overpower this emotion. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to, I want to back up and take like a 3000 foot view with this and have everyone recognize that emotion is human. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be human if we didn't experience emotion. And emotion is, it's all it is, is it's energy. And when we experience a shift in that energy, that's what we would call a feeling. Mm -hmm. So like, if I'm just feeling pretty at ease and calm and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm, uncom I'm uncomfortable. And then I begin to feel like butterflies in my stomach or my chest feels tight. Mm -hmm. Most people would perceive that as negative, not good, 
this needs to change, right? With practice, what we can really begin to understand and move into is just this acknowledgement. Huh, that's interesting. I wonder, I wonder what that's about. Mm-hmm. Like, this is an experience. It doesn't have to be nervousness. It doesn't have to be anxiousness. It doesn't have to be like a name. It doesn't have to be bad. We don't have to judge it. Like, if we can get down into just the bodily sense, the sensation, the sense of it, like that feels heavy or that feels tight, you know, that feels achy or that kind of feels constricted. And we can describe it that way rather than describe it with a label that we've already got a valence around, like stressed. When people say I'm stressed, they're not saying it in a way that's like, I'm stressed. <laughs> <Yay!"> right. right. <laughs> There's a very specific way that it is usually said or perceived. Right? Yeah. So, but that's the thing is we can learn to say like, I'm stressed. And mm-hmm. it totally changes the experience of it. Mm-hmm. We can learn to change the perception of the feeling just by beginning to get in touch with our bodies. And so feelings, thoughts, you know, whatever is going on up here, say the thought is I'm a failure or why did I ever think I could do this? Thoughts are just things. They're words. They're strings of words put together to form a sentence or, you know, an exclamation or sometimes they're really big run-ons and Mm -hmm. they're freaking annoying, but (laughs) they're just thoughts. Mm -hmm. They're not directives. That's the biggest thing that I think has made a difference for a lot of my clients is just recognizing that if you look at it like a, your mind, like a movie marquee, it's just words scrolling across it, like clouds across the sky. We don't like get our lasso and then, you know, hitch onto the cloud and then we're pulled along by it. Like no one's ever tried that. I don't think yet. We do that all the time with our thoughts. Right. Like we almost, and not with every single thought, because if we did this oh, with every single, single thought, then we would yeah. be doing so many weird things that like we would yeah. never actually want to do. But like, <laughs> I think especially when it comes to food and like when people are just, they're trying to diet down for something, whether it's a show or just a wedding or a photo shoot or whatever, like their emotions are already heightened because they're dieting. But like mm-hmm. when they have a thought about food, they think that they have to act on that thought yes. in some way. Yeah. Yes. And if we can help them practice just... It's, I did an experiment one time when I was diet, cause I competed for six years. Mm-hmm. You know, I competed until I got all three pro cards in three divisions. And then I was That's like, awesome. okay. That's so cool. That's dope. Good for <laughs> you. I use the experience. And this is what I would encourage everyone who's in this position to do. Use your experience. Use the actual pursuit of the outcome as practice for living your life. Mm -hmm. for becoming who you want to become, for developing your values, for asking the tough questions like, what do I actually believe here? What's Mm -hmm. really super important to me? What is my philosophy of life? What are the principles I want to live by? You know, when I'm doing something very difficult, that is the only way that I feel like I stay sane. Mm -hmm. So my experiment, I was like, okay, because this was a particularly difficult prep, And I was on very low carbs for a period of time with this prep. And so food thoughts were rampant. Mm -hmm. Just one after the other. Right. (laughs) Which is a normal, like actual physiological reaction for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was, I would feel it in my body and I was tense a lot of the time because while I know that willpower doesn't work, like it's not great to use our willpower to try to like abstain from everything. It's a skill in being able to understand and generate the appropriate mindset for moving more fluidly through a goal. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to, I took, like I had one of these notepads, like okay. eh? I said, okay, I'm going to put a hash mark down (laughs) every time I notice a food thought, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is, you know, I think of it now and it's kind of silly because just based on what's called ironic process theory, when you say something like, 
I'm not going to think about cake. What do you think about? Even think more about. than you would have before. Exactly. So I'm like, I'm just going to put a hashtag down every time I have a food thought. Dude, after like, I'm just going to do this for 10 minutes. Whole freaking page. <laughs> <laughs> And it just like, I mean, think about what would have happened if every time I had a food thought, I actually ate the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But here's the other thing that's awesome to recognize. We have food thoughts when we're not dieting. Mm -hmm. We get hungry when we're not dieting. Right. Our food thoughts, you know we're going to have them. Why? Because it's a normal biological process. We need to eat food to mm -hmm. live, to sustain ourselves. When I'm dieting, I always come back to that. I'm like, you know what? I was freaking hungry when I wasn't dieting. So why is it such a big deal now? Mm -hmm. Like hunger is normal. Absolutely. So it's not the hunger and it's not the thoughts. It's the manner in which we're approaching them. Mm hmm Absolutely. That's the big thing, is right, is that. Today's show is sponsored by Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic is a company that specializes in amazing, wonderful healing mushrooms and adaptogens. You may not know this, but there's literally hundreds of thousands of types of mushrooms. And a lot of them have some really powerful health benefits. So they can help you with everything from hormonal regulation to stress reduction to energy and productivity you name it, even beauty and anti-aging, like there are endless possibilities for mushrooms. My personal favorites are their reishi hot cacao, which helps me wind down at the end of the night and get into a more relaxed state, and the lion's mane elixir, which helps me stay focused without a ton of stimulants. If you want to start experiencing some of the amazing healing and just wellness promoting benefits of mushrooms, then go on over to foursigmatic.com slash mdunk and use the code mdunk at checkout for 15% off your order. Again, that's foursigmatic.com slash mdunk or just use the code mdunk for 15% off your order at checkout. All right, now let's get back into our interview with Dr. Corey Probst. And just like you talked about so many times, just the awareness. Because I think things get so jumbled up in here, especially for that type A person that has so many million things going on. They work, they prep, they have kids, they have dogs, they have another side job or whatever. Like <laughs> we find ways to pile a million things into our lives. And so when there's all that chatter going on up in there, we have no, until we learn how to just be more aware, we have no way of dealing with those thoughts. They're just like swirling around in there. And it's almost like you just want to do something to shut one of them up. Totally. And we can only keep so many of them up there at one time anyway. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's real value to being like, I'm going to download these now. Like, mm -hmm. it, so when you feel like you're spinning in a million directions, use that as a cue, mm -hmm. as an opportunity to say, sit down, breathe, breathe mm -hmm. first, because physiologically you're, you're in threat mode. Right. In space, you're just like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I love that you make noises like me. It's my favorite thing. But I'm so that way. You are probably going to make the probability of you making a poor, unwise decision is ratcheting up pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. just giving yourself give yourself a minute, give yourself 30 seconds to take. Oh. Three big deep breaths. Mm -hmm. You are already putting your nervous system in a space that's going to help you out. Mm -hmm. Like that's such an easy start to a remedy. Mm -hmm. You've got, you can breathe. You've got your breath. Right. Let's use it. Awesome. And then our brains will feel more clear. <laughs> Our prefrontal cortex, which is that part of our brain that's like, hey, dude, like, I really want to help you think clearly and logically and linearly to help you take care of all of these million responsibilities that you have, except you're not helping me out here. Like Mr. Amygdala in the very center, that reptilian part, like it's taking over right now. But if you would just breathe, I could communicate with it, with that monkey in there. Mm -hmm. And calm him down. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read the book Brave Athlete? I have not read. Who wrote that? 
Uh, I don't remember the author's name, but I just read it. It's a sports psychology book, and it's funny that you just referred to the amygdala as the athlete because as, as the monkey, not the monkey. athlete. But in the book, they refer to that as your chimp brain and, like, your smart brain is your professor brain. So you would love that book. It's just, like, all about, like, learning how to work with your psychology and, like, diving deeper. Yeah, awesome. Love mm-hmm. that. But, yes, I think that's so powerful. And I think a lot of conversations lately are just centering around that general theme of mindfulness, just mm-hmm. becoming aware of those thoughts and realizing that, you know, you don't have to act on them and that they are just there. And I think yeah. that's really powerful for the dieter because you're usually higher stressed, you know, just by default. So even like while you're at the restaurant, you can literally just sit there at the table, take those deep breaths and be like, okay, I can still partake in conversation with these people. I can still foster relationships with these people that aren't just centered around what I'm eating. Like mm-hmm. relationships, we bond over food for sure. Mm-hmm. And certain cultures value it more than others, but we don't mm-hmm. forge the relationships that we have with people because we love eating with them. It's because right. we love the person. Yeah, absolutely. There's, you said something that made my brain go, wait, <laughs> <"Bing!" laughs> and that. you know, when, when we're in those situations with other humans, I think it's, it's valuable to go in understanding that the communication the communication piece is really, really important. And what we convey in moments like that is going to influence how people respond to us. Mm -hmm. So for those competitors who are dieting stringently and they're unwilling in a good way to give up those social opportunities, like that was a principle of mine. I'm like, Yes, I am going to have to let go of some things in order to pursue this goal as persistently and consistently as possible. Some of those things may be social, um, but up to a point, like I'm not going to completely isolate myself because I understand how important it is to have those relationships. So if I go into a situation like that and I'm saying I can't eat that, or that's not on my diet, or no, that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. Because the people around us are going to be like, uh, like, are you okay? Like, are you sure? Are you starving? Like, that sounds miserable. Like, do you want to continue this diet? Like, it's, (laughs) it's, <laughs> we're asking for that sort of feedback because they want to protect us. They don't want us to suffer. And if we're putting out that energy that we're putting out that this sucks, I'm miserable, save me. Mm-hmm. That's key. And so like making it <laughs> clear to them that it's a choice that you're willingly making and that you're happy with that choice. And ch- yeah, change your language. Start mm-hmm. assessing for yourself, like how you're talking to people. What are you sharing with them? How are you sharing that with them? Does the en- is the energy you're projecting excited and open and expansive where they're like, ooh, tell me more. Like, how are you doing? What's this like for you? Or does it prompt responses like, oh, like, Meh. like get away. Like, that sounds awful. Why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Beautiful. Awesome. So that's really, really powerful for like a multitude of situations, whether it's with other people or with yourself. But since you touched on it earlier, I do really want to talk about this concept. You said that you don't think self-sabotage is real and it's Mm self-protection. So Mm -hmm. from a dietary perspective or like a Mm -hmm. diet habits perspective, can you just Mm -hmm. kind of talk more about this and like your thoughts on it and everything? Yeah. So I think that let's look at it from the perspective of structured flexibility. Mm -hmm. This is a concept that we teach at the diet doc, which is If you're pursuing any goal, we're using dieting as an example right now for fat loss. Mm -hmm. You need some level of structure, okay? Because that's going to allow you to set some boundaries around what you're going to engage in and what you're not going to engage in. We need, I mean, think of any big goal you've accomplished. And I'll ask everyone who's listening and or watching to do the same. Think of anything that you've accomplished and ask yourself, did you do it with zero structure? Probably not. Probably not. Like, <laughs> if you're out there, please contact me directly because I want to know how it went. you're a miracle. <laughs> you fell into it on a happy accident. 
when there's structure that allows us to have some level of flexibility. If mm -hmm. all we have is flexibility, all we have is chaos, mm -hmm. right? If there's no structure, it's just chaos. It's like, okay, whatever, like whatever goes, how is that going to work? How is right. that? Going it's to like if we just had like stretchy limbs and muscles and we didn't have anything to shorten them or hold them together. We would just be like lumps, mm -hmm. just like flopping around everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. We're not going to be able to get anywhere or do anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, there will be something and we'll do something, <laughs> but not maybe what we want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very funny image, Amelia. <laughs> in my mind now. <laughs> I'm thinking of Gumby, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. My mom always had a little Gumby. Maybe I'm too old. <laughs> but... No, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, self-sabotage, I just, like, it makes me cringe saying it because who knows how to deal with that? When people say I'm self-sabotaging myself, what inevitably happens is they go inward, they think they're awful, they're unworthy, they, the thoughts surrounding it are, I can't do this, I'm never going to be good enough, mm -hmm. because they believe that they actually want to hurt themselves. It's just the term doesn't even help. Right. So once you identify we're self-sabotaging, then what? Because if, if you we, want to hurt yourself, then you're not going to want to fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that's really what you want to do, then, and that's important to you, sabotaging yourself. Okay. Then, okay, we've identified that. But coming at it from a different lens, which is you are hurting yourself mm -hmm. by doing it. not you want to like, you're not a sadistic human being. Now there are some people out there like that, of course, but <laughs> this is not for you. <laughs> you've set the goal. It's important to you. You want to meet it and get to that outcome. No, if, if, if something happens and you engage in an, in a behavior that is not aligned with you getting to that goal, I'm thinking you got some other commitments going on, mm -hmm. you know? And so what I like to have people do is called a decisional balance exercise to get really in touch with the pros and the cons of engaging in the goal and not engaging in the goal. Mm -hmm. Because when I ask clients like, well, what, what are all the advantages of engaging in this goal? Oh, the list is super long, right? Mm -hmm. What are all the cons of engaging in this goal? What are all the cons of losing 25 pounds? Cons? No, there aren't any cons of losing 25 pounds. Hang on. Like, that's your first thought. Mm -hmm. Here's another exercise for everyone who's listening. You're going to have a first thought. I want you to practice saying on second thought <laughs> and then really reflect <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because there are tons of cons, especially in the beginning. I'm going to lose 25 pounds. Yes. I'm so excited. My motivation is way up in the sky. There are no cons. Mm -hmm. Hang on. Okay. Are there any costs? Let me change the language a little bit. Are there any costs to pursuing this goal? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I'm going to have to give up my pita chips. <laughs> Those, or, are ones. Those are great. I may need to change how often I'm drinking with my partner. Mm -hmm. That's our connection time. That's what we do every night when he comes home from work and we're going over our days together. Oh, so now we're finding out that some of the things that are involved in the... <laughs> the issues <laughs> around being overweight are also attached to connection and love and relationships. Mm -hmm. So it would be 
having the person identify what those costs are, what they may need to let go of and begin to reflect upon and work around because can we still connect with our partners and work towards the goal at the same time? But this person is committed to a good relationship and connection and committed to the goal. Well, if we continue the way things are with the amount of alcohol that they're consuming while we're pursuing the goal, now those those commitments are competing. They're butting up against each other and mm -hmm. they're fighting. And that that creates some internal tension where we're like, God, I don't know what to do because they're both so freaking important to me. Right. But there's assumptions in there. There's an assumption when the person is in that space, there's an assumption that I, this is the only way that I can connect with my partner is by doing it. And it's getting around that assumption and approaching it like a beginner's mind. Like, can you pretend that you have that, just pretend that you have no associations, no biases, like you're looking at this from a fresh perspective. Or let's pretend that Corey's in your head right now and what would she do? What Debbie would Katie, what would Corey do? <laughs> <laughs> just go there. What would Emily do? Mm -hmm. Okay. She's had a completely different life, different experiences. So getting them to think outside of their own sort of biased brains to when they recognize that they've got commitments that are competing against each other to choose a new behavior, to try, to experiment with, to see what happens. Because they're assuming the worst. If I quit drinking, we're not connecting. Well, that's possible. That's possible. But we don't know that for sure. So let's try it. And, and or maybe we have a conversation with your partner about how important this goal is to you and what you'd like to try with them and how important connecting with them is at the same time. And what's he willing to negotiate also with you? Mm -hmm. So coming back to self-sabotage versus self-protection, self-sabotage to me is just an, if we're calling it that, if someone comes to you, you know, as a client and says, I'm self-sabotaging in your mind, I would want you to be thinking this person has competing commitments. Mm -hmm. What are they trying to protect? Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, you know, when it, especially because for people that are just getting into fitness and, you know, making better nutritional habits, it's a, it's a huge change. For them, mm -hmm. and if they have if they have someone in their life, you know, it's a lot easier if you're single, not in a relationship. You know, sure. you don't have any friends. You just are. A <laughs> it's a lot easier to make that change. But I think we also fear yes. because of that, like relational aspect and that connection mm -hmm. aspect. We fear the potential of mm -hmm. possibly inconveniencing someone or Absolutely. having to ask them if they will support us in our goals because we're afraid of what if they say no. Sure. And it's very possible that they will say no. And, you know, I, I work with a lot of competitors too. And I am, I really am constantly saying, you cannot expect your partner to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's not a fair request. Mm -hmm. They're not interested. <laughs> and that's okay. Their interests and goals and desires are just as important as your interests and goals. Mm -hmm. So if you go into the conversation or the situation thinking that, like you're riding in on your high horse and thinking that, you know, your goals should be honored and they should be making all the changes to accommodate, it's not going to go well, guys. Mm -hmm. There has to be respect on both sides. Absolutely. And when there's respect and you can go in from that perspective, your partner is going to be a lot more generous and receptive to wanting to support you. Like maybe pita chips are your kryptonite and your partner loves them. Like maybe he only eats them at work, for example. Um, but to be demanding that they support you in a way that requires them to make all the changes, that's just not fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't get to just go about your life the way that you right. want to go about it without considering the people in your life. Because if you're blessed enough to have loving and nurturing relationships in your life, like it's a two-way street. 
Mm-hmm. It's not just, mm-hmm. hey, here's what I want to do. You can catch up. Right. It's, hey, here's what I want to do. How can we make this as easy and as fun and as still awesome for both of us as possible? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. Gorgeous. Okay. So <laughs> last kind of thing. What are, so just quick thing. What are some of the best and worst behaviors you see around food? And when mm-hmm. it comes to the best ones, how can people yeah. cultivate those? And when it comes to the yeah. worst ones, how can we work to become more aware of them and maybe create some better behaviors? Well, that's a really good question. So, okay. Oh, I'm pinging all over the place. Now I'm <laughs> I <laughs> love it. focused here. Because <laughs> there's so, so, many. Ah, so many. Yeah. So I as you know, like I keep paper in here a lot. Oh no, that's what I do like while I podcast. Oh, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so here's what was going through my head, um, intuitive eating and me not necessarily liking that term. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to call it intelligent eating. Ooh, I like that too. Cause like before you even get into it, I think one of the, the big problems that I notice with people is when they go about this, they're like, well, I want chocolate today. Next day, oh, well, I want ice cream today. Next day, oh, I want pizza today. I'm just listening to my intuition. This is good. This is how it's supposed to go. And it's like, <laughs> not quite. Not quite. <laughs> still have health in mind here, you know? Yes. Yep. Here's the other thing. What does health mean to you? What does it look like? Mm-hmm. And when you're eating intelligently, what does it look like? Pretend I'm a fly on the wall. When you're eating intelligently, how would I know? Would you be sitting down and eating or would you be scarfing your food at the counter? Would you actually be preparing a meal or would you just be rummaging around in the refrigerator and shoving food in your face? Mm-hmm. Um, because that's going to look different for everyone. But I think the people who demonstrate the, I would say most generative open expansive and freedom building types of eating habits into their lives are operating from this place of eating as an act of Mm self-compassion i love that and that's it's wise it's intelligent it's understanding of what they've done that day and what they may be doing that day. It's understanding of the nourishment that that food actually provides for them. What it isn't Mm -hmm. is (laughs) because I have a beef with this. It's if it fits your macros. Mm -hmm have to be careful with that <laughs> because get all the trolls come all the trolls down here's what i see work. happening with it though that really concerns me is people eating up to their macros thinking they have to fill the macros mm-hmm. thinking that even when they're not hungry oh but i gotta get in that protein oh but i gotta eat all those carbs oh but i have all this fat to eat but what if you're not hungry You're just going to shove that food in anyway. And it's almost like having macros and I teach my clients macros. Like we give them macro ranges. It's almost like for a lot of people, they take it to such this rigid place where everything goes. Mm -hmm. We lose health we lose nourishment, we lose actual nutrition, we lose, this is why this food is going to give you the best energy and vitality. And we go to shove everything you can, even if it's crap, into your macros. Mm -hmm. It's the worst way I feel to approach your nutrition. Mm -hmm. If you want to feel awful, fantastic go for it 
but if you want this to be something that is enduring, something that's sustainable, something that feels good to you, something that feels freeing and liberating, something that allows you to have some level of structure and flexibility, then it needs define health for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and Joe would say like, I probably have one of the more rigid, I have pretty rigid nutritional standards for myself. Mm -hmm. To him, to him, because he'll eat a slice of cake before his workout. I, I love cake. I do. And I'll eat cake, but I won't eat it before a workout. Like I have my own kind of rules and boundaries because I understand how it affects my body, how it affects my energy. And if I'm going into a workout to do something really good for my body, while yes, a piece of cake is very quickly digested carbohydrates and sugar that's going to give me quick energy. So macro wise, it's fine. Like, I don't want to put that in my body when I'm going to go do something good for my body. Like, to me, it's, I want something more pure and nutritious. Um, That doesn't mean I'm eating a bowl of broccoli because that doesn't work. Yeah, it's carbs, but it's like fiber. So no, Right. right. But it's, it's that whole thing, I think, Emily, which is, can we be aware? Can we actually think through what we're doing and ask ourselves the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? How does this make any sense based on my values, based on my principles, based on what I say is important to me, I'm saying I want to be healthy. Am I acting that way? Like in the way that I'm thinking, in the way that I'm behaving, in the way that I'm choosing my food sources, in the way that I'm talking to people, am I embodying, embody radio? I love it. I love it. That was (laughs) awesome. I'll send you your check later. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I think- Yeah, Yeah, I think that's so, so important too, because I think one of the big problems, you know, social media is a great tool. Obviously it's how I found you. It's how I found so many wonderful, influential people. But I think one of the big problems is there's a couple. For one, I think people try and take someone else's version of health and make it theirs, Mm -hmm. which doesn't work because health truly does look and feel so different for every single person. You know, some people, they need a little bit more flexibility. Some people, they just feel healthier when things are a little more rigid. There's just different styles of people, different things that work for everyone. And then another problem too is I think when people get overly critical of what others are doing, so maybe they're not trying to adopt what someone else is doing, but they take a look at what someone else is doing. And because Mm -hmm. it's different from what they do, that person Mm -hmm. is automatically wrong or unhealthy or disordered or whatever. And then they in their mind, believe that they're automatically right. As That's the very astute. Doing what they do. Yeah. And I see a lot of coaches interacting with their clients that way. There's only one way to do this. Mm-hmm. No. In fact, there are as many people on the planet ways of doing this. Absolutely. And if we're not attuned to and paying attention to what our, act- our clients are actually conveying to us and saying they feel good doing and we're not looking at the every context of their lives you know to help them set up that structure in a way that's going to be that they're going to be able to continue long term then we're really really missing the boat Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. the one way fits all coaches i think are are on their way out because i mean you take somebody that's a nurse you can't tell them to eat six small meals a day oh man it's just not going to work Mm -hmm. So you you as the coach, you have to be adaptable and you have to, God forbid, actually take the time to get to know the person you're working with and realize (laughs) what they need, what works for them, what doesn't, and how to make the diet or the program or whatever fit their lifestyle. Because you can't just shove a program at someone and just just tell them, make it work. Totally. It's, I really, one of my favorite things to do is to say, you know, because all of us get triggered, even as coaches, as experienced as we are, we're going to have client situations where I'm like, okay, got to step away from the computer here, going to take an hour or two, or maybe a day (laughs) before I respond. Mm -hmm. But it's to say, I am going to look at this with fresh eyes, Mm -hmm. beginner's mind, as best I can, zero, zero association, zero connection, zero biases, like I am seeing this person from for the very first time. Mm -hmm. Ah, 
I'm able to open up in a way that I wouldn't if I just, I go into the situation having met with however many clients that day and I've got all that stuff, you know, floating around in here and what's good and what's bad and what's wrong and what's right and how it should be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even for each individual who's listening to this podcast, just take that stance at some point during your day and ask, like, if I were to approach this from a beginner's mind, no, it's like a baby when they're learning to walk, right? They're not thinking I'm such a failure when they fall and they don't just sit there. They get up again and again and again and again and again and again until they get it. Here we are. Yeah. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Just taking that, like switching, pu putting the lens onto what do I need yeah. instead of what am I being told that I need, whether mm -hmm. it be subconsciously or consciously. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. really, really powerful. This episode in general has just been super powerful. So mm -hmm. I'll start winding mm -hmm. it down because this has been incredible. Thank you so much for just all of that beautiful, wonderful perspective. I think it's going to be really, really impactful and helpful for people because mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is not necessarily handing someone you know, in an interview, like, Hey, do this and this and this and this, and you'll be mm -hmm. set to go. Cause like we mm -hmm. talked about, you know, one thing doesn't work for everyone, but just giving people the questions to ask themselves mm -hmm. or the, the viewpoint to maybe try and look at things at. So now people can actually stop and be like, yes. why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? Who am I doing this for? So I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But uh, so one question that I ask all of my interview subjects is based off of my Wonder Woman mentality, which the shortened mm -hmm. version is to find out what makes you strong and what makes you awesome and run with it. So what is it that makes you, Corey, strong, unique, and awesome? I love, I love that question. Thank you. And I, I'm going to come back to, because it's easier for me to speak in terms of what others have shared with me mm -hmm. rather than this is what I think about myself. Um. I've, my mom, I may start crying. <laughs> oh, I love moms. They're the best. They are the best. My mom has given me two compliments in my life that, man, well, you can see they, they hit me at my core. They make my heart really literally break open. Mm -hmm. um, one thing she said to me was, Corey, you are just so easy to be around. Oh. And it's, like, I love hearing that because I strive to be that person mm -hmm. that people feel like they can come to and talk to and, and feel understood by and feel safe and trusting um, around. The other thing she said to me was, you know, <laughs> you make a lot of mistakes in your life, core. She called me core or cur. <laughs> you make a lot of mistakes, honey. Yet, every time you do, you always get up and come back stronger I love that and it's true like I've made a lot of bad decisions <laughs> not great decisions um with the information that I had at the time I they were good decisions mm -hmm. but the outcomes didn't turn out fantastic and yet i somehow was resilient enough and pulled myself up and, and recovered well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, and I, I actually just received this compliment today, and I have to thank my partner, Dr. Joe, for it. Mm -hmm. um, he has said that one of the greatest qualities of mine is that I laugh easily and that I'm a positive person. And... <laughs> it makes that makes me very happy because I wasn't always that way. Um, I was very much shut down and more pessimistic than optimistic. And that's a practice for me just to be like, let it go, Corey. It doesn't have to be so difficult. Like you're making it that way. Like don't get the defensiveness, the walls, let them go. And um, so that, that sense of lightness is something that um, that's very important to me as I move through my days as a human being and what I would say makes me somewhat of a wonder woman. <laughs> I think that makes you a full, full blooded. Woman. I love that. That is so awesome. You know what? I saw something the other day that made me think of your second point, but it was just this 
kind of like poem type situation. It was from a writer and she was like, I don't have regrets. People always ask me if I have regrets. I have wonderings, just wondering what might've happened differently. Mm -hmm. And I know that I made the the best decision I could have made at the time. Yeah. And you know, that's all we can do. I think we're all just trying to wander through and make the best decisions that we can make Mm -hmm. at any given time with any given situation. And we're Mm -hmm. all going to make mistakes, but Mm -hmm. it's either going to be the nail in the coffin or it's going to be a catalyst for a better life. So I think that that is truly a hallmark of a very strong person as somebody that can just use it as the catalyst and not the nail in the coffin. So I think that's beautiful. And you've got a great mama, it sounds like. And we all know that. I do. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, since I know that everybody's going to want to know where they can find you, where they can consume mm. just more of your knowledge and your light that you put out there, plug away. Where can people find you? Is it a website, <laughs> podcast? Is it, do you have seminars? Where can they go to get more of Dr. Probst? Yeah. Thank you, Emily. We have a podcast also, uh, Dr. Joe and I, a daily podcast actually, and it's called awesome. the Diet Doc Life Mastery Podcast. Awesome. And that can be found on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, YouTube, if you prefer to watch rather than listen, it's also on our website in the blog. And our website is www.thedietdoc.com. Um, our YouTube channel is The Diet Doc Weight Loss. And people can find me on Instagram. It's The Diet Doc Weight Loss. Again, I'm posting regularly on there. I'd love to interact with you through that medium. We're on Facebook as well, The Diet Doc. And you can find me just on my page, Corey Probst. Awesome. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Google+. Plus. Probably the best ways would be um, the podcast especially and awesome. interact with us that way. Yeah. Well, obviously, everybody that's listening loves podcasts, and I'm always getting requests. I know. I love podcasts. There you guys go. And they put one out every day. So that's even better. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Emily. Really, I appreciate it. You're doing great things. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right, you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did, and I will talk to you guys next week.